turn to the book of Romans, chapter 15. Chapter I read earlier in chapter 5, and that's going to be one of our follow-up passages. It will also appear on the screen here. We're going to start reading at verse 4. We're going to read through verse 13 as we continue in our Asian Coast series. Romans 15, verse 4 reads as follows. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, and one who raises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of God for us, the people of God, and we say thanks be to God. We're going to spend a few minutes talking about the way is hope. The way is hope. Come and continue. The way is hope. Let's talk a word. Gracious God, once again, we have come and gathered in this space. And it is our desire to be as fully present in you as possible. So that as you speak, Silence any and all voices in our heads and our minds and our souls and our bodies. That we may clearly hear you as you desire to speak to us. That we might be transformed, changed, and inspired to move forward in Jesus' name. So for my entire life, I have been committed to the church of God in some form or fashion. And I have had highs and lows. I have struggled with bitterness and aberration. And I have even been envious of people who, even if for a very short amount of time, were able to spend the season away from the church. I've been equally envious of those who didn't seem to need a break, as I often did. And there were many times where I wanted to walk away, but I couldn't. And that's what I didn't completely understand. And after I went to seminary, I had a whole other level of information and a whole other threshold of what it meant to be the church. And I could see even more clearly the disparities between how we were living out this broken understanding of humanity and the church um, as it regards what we were supposed to be doing. And I think the culminating moment came for me. I was at a conference, um, sitting in a room on church planting, and the presenter began to talk about how we really needed to plant churches where people were all alike. He said, people are most comfortable with people who are like them, and so we'll all be happy and get more work done if we are just around people that are the same. Now, he said that he had planted a church of bikers. Uh, they all drove Harleys and wore leather and loved Jesus. His words, not my like <laughs> And I began to sit there and I felt like everything he was saying was very cowardly. I felt like what he was saying was that once again, the mainstream church is finding a way to keep people out that they are comfortable. 
finding a way to say that all you have to do is be around people who look like you and act like you, and that's doing what God has asked us to do. And I wanted to walk away. And I couldn't really understand why, and so I began to seek God around why can't I just leave for just a little while? Just give me a break for just a little while. And God began to bring to my memory that I had been taught as a little girl that if at first you don't succeed, you try That's right. again. That's right. I had been taught that love was more binding than law. And I loved God. Even when I was mad at God, I loved God. I had been taught that God was married to the church. And so to walk with one was to automatically walk with the other. And then God convicted me. God said, Donna, the things that you see, the things that you feel are not intended to make you walk away. They're not intended to make you feel trapped in a miserable marriage. They're intended to inspire you to take risks to make things better. They're intended to help you understand what it feels like to be outside of the church. Mm -hmm but also convict you enough to hold those accountable who in their brokenness and pain continuously present behavior that repels others, even when that behavior is me. And I said, okay, God, I got it. But now I have another dilemma. I've never seen that before. What does that look like? And our God sent me to the West. The book of Romans is the longest letter to survive that Paul wrote. Paul, a man who used to kill Christians, believed their message and became the most renowned of Christians. Yeah. And during this time of Romans, there was this ongoing theme of trying to make a, a plea to heal the rift between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. People who grew up Jewish and folk who weren't. And so there was this ongoing theme in Romans specifically around what it means to be unified despite differences and diversity. Now, Paul did more than just teach this. I mean, Paul was very strategic in this because this is a really big deal. I mean, Paul did stuff like having the Gentile churches raise money for the poverty in Jerusalem, which was the holy city of the Jews. Wow, wow. This was a big deal. So this is one kind of consistent ongoing theme in the book of Romans. But the second thing is this message of hope. Hope appears 17 times in the book of Romans. That's more than any other New Testament ah! in existence, right? Yeah. Hope. Hope is more than believing our dreams will come true. And as a matter of fact, hope is probably more accurately characterized as believing in the right outcome, even in the face of the most difficult and strenuous situations. Hope goes deeper than just believing it will be. Romans chapter 5. The verse come up in a minute, but in Romans chapter 5, he uh, actually says that hope is connected to suffering. Pastor mm -hmm. Mike read it earlier. And not only that we boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. But he goes further in chapter 8, verse 24. And he says that if you, um, if you see hope, then it's not really hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because hope is what? Unseen. Yeah. Even further, and he says that there is a direct link between faith and hope. In his letter to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, he says, What faith is what? The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. No, hope is more than just saying your dreams gonna come true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hope is getting to the end of your road at the edge of the cliff with your enemies behind you and you still think that that might be a way out. Yeah. <laughs> right? Hope is, and there's this little quote that says that hope is, is like that small whisper that says maybe when it seems like the entire world is saying no. 
And I don't know of any other way in which the world screams no louder than when it comes to whether or not we can love each other as humans in mutual respect and honor. I mean, it seems like we cannot fully love and respect ourselves without hating somebody else. Yeah. And at the very base level, it seems like we at least compare our qualities to the qualities of others in a way that creates hierarchies of worth and value. Yeah. No, we scream no right. when it comes to human value and worth and quality, unity and diversity. And so hope is more than this. Hope is greater than dream. Hope is beyond just the everyday conversations that we have when we mention the word hope. So the question becomes then, what chance do we have? Because Paul is clearly laying out in here that we are to be unified in hope. And I, for one, believe that we have been called to this, and I, for one, also believe that Paul has laid out for us that this is not something we can walk away from. I believe that the way this church mm -hmm. has a specific call. Yeah. I believe it is very clear and very apparent. I believe that the way has a call to hope when everybody else around it is saying that it's too hard. I believe that the way has a call to stay the course, even when everybody else wants to quit. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of people and a lot of churches fight for justice, but many of them do so in their own isolated cultural silos of education, of class, and race. And even in those cases where there are churches where there are many different people who look many different ways, the message is usually very watered down and generalized in order to appeal to the masses rather than being the hard, core truth of the gospel. Right. This is not an easy call. Paul was saying, I want you to include the haves and the have-nots. The blacks, the whites, the browns, the yellows, the reds, the men and the women, the young, and go. Dare I even say, regardless of sexual orientation, all are welcome when it comes to what it means to be a part of Christ's community. Amen. So I believe that this text gives us something. That when in the midst of failure, we want to give up, we can cling to some of the things in this passage and they will make us want to try again. Mm. The first thing that I think we must remember when we're moving towards unified diversity is that it is not within our power. Yeah. Unified diversity is not within our power. Verses four and five of this Romans 15, say that both scripture and God grant us our steadfast and they give us encouragement. Now, steadfast is a word that we may hear quite often, but to really think about what the word steadfast means, means to really hold on to something pretty powerful. Steadfast is kind of this underlasting constancy of not giving up. Okay? It is unmovable. It is unrelenting in its nature. All right? It is unreasonably obstinate. That's what steadfast means. Steadfast is my mom and my dad, when my great uncle Ray was in the hospital and he was on a ventilator. And the hospital says he will never be off this ventilator. So we have to transport him to a long term care facility. But my parents felt that something was wrong with that because my uncle seemed strong. He seemed willing to fight for it. And they were like, no, this facility is so far away. I don't think that this is what we can do. Can we take some more steps to try before you quit so soon? 
The staff of the hospital work was adamant. They resulted as they got closer and closer into uh, threatening because if the bill wasn't paid, right? If they stayed in the hospital much longer and this bill wasn't paid, we're going to take their house. All these different things started to happen. Long story short, my parents were unrelenting. My uncle not only came off that ventilator, but he lived well over a year after that at home. Steadfast, unrelenting, stubborn. What does it mean? What does it mean to live in a reality where we have a God who is stubborn and unrelenting in his love for us? Yeah. Yeah. A God who never gives up on doing what he needs to do to make sure we got hope. A steadfast God. What does that mean to you? And if we continue to read back in Romans, if we go back to Romans, you see that it tells us in chapter 5, verse 5, that God actually pours out his love into us through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And this is how we receive hope. That it's not just that God gives us love, that God literally pours his love into us through the gifting of the Holy Spirit. Now, the second part of this is encouragement. Encouragement is the emotional counterpart to steadfastness. Encouragement is taken in this passage from the same word that we pull the word paraclete. What is a paraclete? The paraclete is a historical name for the, the Holy Spirit, which means the advocate, right? What does it mean to be encouraged? To be encouraged means to inspire with courage, spirit, or confidence. To fill with influence that brings life and exalts. God does what? He breathes life into Adam and Eve. Yeah. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. In Ezekiel, there are dry bones. They are dead. And what happens? The breath of four winds blows over them and they what? Come to life. Encouragement is literally, it's literally being brought to life when you would die to fail yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what the God who is unrelentingly and stubborn in loving us does for us. Mm -hmm. This is what his word does for us. When we are ready to turn around and give love hope. This is what God does for us. Amen. This passage says that we can't do this. It says may the God of the steadfast God and you know, of encouragement and hope grant us what we need to live in harmony. This task of what it means to be in a space with people who are different in love is too big of a task for us. It's too hard. But it is not too hard for our God. It is about God giving us what we need in order to accomplish this. It is about us trusting God. So if you're in a place in your life where you feel like failure is inevitable and you're ready to throw in the towel, you need to ask yourself, have I relied on the grace of my God enough? Because maybe I'm trying to do something on my own that is impossible. So our hope is not based in the maybe. It's based in the how. Why? Because Christ has tore down partitions and barriers between us. Yeah. And so the question isn't, can this happen? It's how does this happen? And if Christ started something, Christ is going to finish something. Yeah. The question is, are we willing to trust God enough oh, yeah. that when we walk through that door to follow his instructions? Because once we get on the other side, that's stuff we ain't never seen. Yeah. We ain't never lived as humans. Loving each other, right? <laughs> so when God opens a brand new door, we have to be willing to walk through and then trust God for the steps beyond that. Why? Because this is not within our power. It's within God's power. The second thing we need to remember about unified diversity is that it is not about being alike or learning to be alike. It's not about learning to be alike. Now in Book of Corinthians, Paul gives this analogy that you and Pastor Mike talk about all the time, and that is that we are one body, many members. Mm -hmm. Right? So if we take one portion of our body, for example, let's take a circulatory system, a system that circulates blood. 
right, throughout our body. There are three different kinds of blood vessels in our circulatory system. Okay? The first is called arteries. And generally, arteries pump blood away from the heart into the body towards tissue. Okay? And it has a high blood pressure because it is moving directly from the heart with this strong force so that it can push its way through the body. Then we have capillaries. Now capillaries are the most common form of veins in our um, blood vessels in our bodies. They are small, they are thin, okay? And they are designed to take um, oxygen, nutrients, um, all kinds of things really close to the cells of our tissue so that they can receive what they need. They even exchange waste products so that our tissues are clean and clean, okay? Now, there's a third blood vessel. And that third blood vessel is called the vein. The vein is the largest blood vessel. And the veins pump blood back to the heart. But it is the counterpart of the artery, which means that it has a lower blood pressure. Our veins actually use gravity, inertia, and skeletal muscle in order to push blood back to the heart so that the process can be continued. Yeah. Now this is just a small portion of a very complex thing that happens in our bodies all the time. That, by the way, we ain't got no control, but it happens in everybody. <laughs> It's a very small portion of a very complex thing that happens. And I think what is so phenomenal about just this one small portion is that we find that these are three things that are classified as the same, but yet they do very different tasks. Okay? What does that mean for us? It means that we have to pay attention to the fact that we may be pressed together because there are similarities that make us all be classified in the same group. But if we were all alike doing the same thing, it could quite possibly cause us to die. <laughs> if all of these blood vessels did the same thing, we would not be able to survive. <laughs> we are one body, many members. There are differences that are necessary for our survival. Mm -hmm. Differences that we allow to separate us rather than bring us together. Mm -hmm. Now I am suggesting to you that the way is in fact called to lead the example of what it means not only to live amid our differences, but to live in light of them. Mm -hmm. To show the way of what it looks like to walk in this thing. Right. So our passage today tells us that we are to glorify God together. Right. Right? With one voice. Yes. But then it goes on to say that we are to welcome each other as Christ has welcomed us. Now that last part makes all the difference in the world. As Christ has welcomed us. Now I want you to just think for a second. That Christ has welcomed us. Welcomed me. Welcomed you. Knowing all our stuff. Yeah. All the stuff that other folk don't know. Right. All our secrets. Yeah. Right? He has accepted our inconsistency. Right? Our brutal truths. Our sins. And he still welcomed us and never questioned us before welcoming us. Right. Yeah. Right? Then that's just to get ourselves together before we got What? No, you can't do that. <laughs> right? You can't come to me like that. Christ doesn't do that. And so what does it mean? For us to welcome others as Christ has welcomed us. Yes. Right. But as we move further down in the passage, we see that Paul is actually saying to the Jews, I want you to accept the Gentiles. He said, I want you to accept outsiders and put them inside. Yeah. And I think it's very important here for us to recognize that the Jews did not have to give up circumcision, which was a religious practice of theirs. But nor did the Gentiles have to be circumcised in order to become a part of this community. Right. What does this teach us? This teaches us that there are some things on the peripheral vision, right? Some beliefs on the periphery that will be different when we invite different people into our community. There will be some differences there, right? Some differences that are not intended to break us apart, but if, if, if done properly, can actually enrich how we do these things. Right. But there will be some differences. And it means that we will not be 
the life. It means that we will not always agree on all things. But the whole point is not to be alike. Because if we were all alike, we die. The final thing that we need to be mindful of is that we need to remember that unified diversity is not about Unified diversity is not about being uninhibited. It's not about being uninhibited. We have some very strange notions about freedom. And all the time, our notions of freedom is connected to our understanding of time. I think I shared in this, in this um, space once before that when elevators were first made, you know, people complained about how long it took the doors to close. They said the 10 second wait was too long. And so what the engineers do, engineers put a button in that was a closed button that people could touch. It didn't change how long it took the doors to close. <laughs> but people stopped complaining because they felt like they had the freedom of choice, right, over their time. There is something about us feeling as if, as if we have lost a sense of our freedom if we are put in a position where we don't have a choice that impacts our time. Right. And it's an illusion. And it's an illusion because we are all connected to other people by the nature of how God has created yeah. us. And so does that mean that when we are impacted by others, that we are not free? Right. For example, if you're on the freeway and there's an accident, everybody going in that direction must slow down or stop. Right. You can't control it. You can't change it. Now, I want it to be very clear, though. That doesn't mean we don't have choices. The issue is we may not have the choices we want. Right. Right? Now, I can choose to cuss and fuss and let my blood pressure get real high. <laughs> I can choose to abandon my car, get out and walk. <laughs> or I can choose to accept the space where I am. Right. To acknowledge that this is what I got to do. <laughs> And to pray that if there's an accident ahead, that everybody is all right. Yeah. Just because we are impacted by others, does that mean we are not free? Mm -hmm. right. Pastor Mike, for the past few weeks, has really talked about our early African church father, Augustine, and his notions of free will. And in essence, this thought that freedom is not just the ability to choose, but it is always having the ability to choose right. Right. And for us, choosing right means that we are going to be inhibited for the sake of somebody else. We're going to have limitations. This passage today says that Christ became a servant to circumcision. Why? So that Jews and Gentiles might be saved. He became a servant. Christ became limited. Christ became inhibited such that we might have what we need. Yes. Yes. But further, we see that Desmond Tutu teaches, teaches that love is more binding than law. And if God is stubborn and unrelenting in his love for us, <coughs> that means that God is bound to us by his love. Yes. Bound sounds a lot different from free. Yes. Theologian Gerald Craig says something along the lines of Christ is bound by the necessity of his righteousness. Yes. That the stability of the moral order rests on this unalterable truth. If God is bound by the way he chooses to be in relationship to us, then we too must be bound. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not because it hurts us. But because in love with someone else, it frees us. Yeah, so good. Yeah. You see, this is why, in the face of failure, we can't stop. Right. When we encounter truth, we can't quit. Because justice demands it. Amen. This church well knows justice. But justice isn't just about God making right the things that are wrong in this world. Justice is also about God making right what is wrong in us. Yes. 
Reconciliation is an act of justice. Healing of pain through forgiveness is an act of justice. Salvation through Christ is an act of justice. Yes. Now, since I was a young girl, I have felt drawn to this concept, this understanding, this meaning of what it means to live in unified diversity. Accepting everyone's differences, not blanketing them over, not acting like certain things don't impact other people, but really doing the hard core work of living together even though we're different. Yes. This unseen reality of unity and diversity being two sides of the same thing. And I was giving up when my only job was to keep going. And God brought me here. So I'm leaving with a fresh breath of life being blown apart. I have a tenacity in my spirit and a steadfastness in my heart to not stop going. And if you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember this. And that is when you face failure on this task, on this call, please remember that trying again is a part of your honest, authentic Christian witness to the world. That it's not about always getting it right. It's about always trying again when you don't. It's about being consistent in how you love each other and in how you love this world. Because the justice that God is doing in us is only just if everybody, everybody has access to the same thing. Bow your heads. I want to pray over you. These final words of blessing that Paul prayed to them in this letter. Take a moment to salvage your mind and your thoughts and fully receive each word of this blessing. Know that God is not only present with you, but God's Spirit is touching you, is kissing you in this moment. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in trusting so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh -huh.